my topic this evening is governing London. Um, London is a, is a city which shares much with, um, with Sydney, uh, in the sense that both can stake a credible claim to the status of a global city. Um, and in that sense, I think, uh, exchange of ideas between experiences in cities like Sydney uh, and, and London, I think is extremely valuable uh, in order to improve our understandings of our own cities. So from that point of view, um, I think this kind of dialogue between colleagues here in Sydney and, and colleagues in London has the potential to be extremely valuable. Having said that, I'm always very conscious of the dangers of, um, uh, of, of fast policy transfers between cities, taking lessons, extracting them from a particular context, taking them to the other side of the world and applying them to a context where, uh, which is completely different. Uh, and it's in that process that often lessons, lessons are not learned, things go wrong, uh, transfers uh, of experience prove to be unhelpful. Nevertheless, so for that reason rather, um, what I'm going to do today, this evening, is I'm not going to make explicit comparators between uh, London and Sydney. I'm going to t tell you the London story, and it might be in discussion that we begin the process of this process of comparison. Having said that, um, it is useful just to um, be aware of some of the differences between London and Sydney in this, in this uh, context, um, because these differences are important, and I'll assume, these dif that, that, I'll assume that I've established these differences in your mind as we, as we go ahead. Um, so, important differences, number one. London's a very, very old city. Um, it was founded, as far as we know, by the Romans. It may have been that there was some settlement that they took over before that. Sydney was established much later. Uh, London is, by comparison to Sydney, a very compact city. Okay, these terms like London and Sydney are, are, are to some extent administrative artifacts, but uh, London's uh, area is, is uh, much smaller than that of Sydney, but its population is much larger than that of Sydney, therefore it's more densely populated. But the issue that I'm going to be uh, focusing on this evening is the differences in governance in the two cities. Um, and you'll see some striking facts at the beginning here. Um, Sydney uh, lacks a metropolitan arena of governance. Um, I think it, the, the county of Cumberland, I, still, I, think believe, I believe, still exists in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a legal sense, but in, for practical purposes, it lacks a, a metropolitan structure of government. Um, the, the, the state government is, is very active and important in its development. And below that, of course, there are 38 local government areas within the Sydney um, uh, metropolitan area. London's quite different. It does have a, scale, a metropolitan scale of government um, in the form particularly of the mayor of London, uh, who, who uh, is the uh, primary political uh, authority in relation to uh, the metropolitan area. Uh, the mayor's activities are overseen by an elected assembly, the London Assembly, and below that are 32 boroughs. So in many ways, compared to Sydney, um, London is undergoverned. There are, there are fewer structures of governance governing London, a larger city in population terms than, than Sydney. Uh, and that's just something to bear in mind as, as we go ahead. So what I'd like to do today uh, is um, talk a bit about some of the ideas which animate debates about urban governance and explore this relationship very briefly in, in an emerging body of literature about the relationship between the growth of cities uh, and particular forms of urban governance. Then I want to look at London, the case of London in the context of some of these ideas. I want to say something about London's relationship to its, to, uh, to its national context, something about uh, its relationship to its global context, and something about the socio-economic and spatial changes which have taken place within London recently. And then I want to look at the way in which the governance of London has responded to some of these developments. And then, of course, to focus in particular on the question of planning. And then finally, to perhaps draw some conclusions from this discussion, um, which may be hopefully the basis for a, a, a discussion. So, I want to just focus very briefly on three important contributions to thinking about the nature of the city. Um, the first is uh, 
a very important and influential book by Edward Glaser called The Triumph of the City. I'm sure many people in this audience, anybody who's interested in cities, there's a good chance that you've, you've read this book. All of these books, incidentally, come from the United States, but they've all had tremendous global influence and certainly a uh, big influence in the UK. Triumph of the City is a book in which Edward Glaser argues that uh, we live in an urban world, uh, but more, more importantly, cities are the future. Why are they the future? Because cities express a natural tendency within capitalism for economic activity to agglomerate, to concentrate in particular places, because by concentrating in particular places, uh, firms in particular derive productivity advantages. Cities, particularly global cities, prosper because they attract smart people who interact, produce innovations, which are the mechanisms by which the, uh, the world economy operates. Um, he says some other things in this book. One of the important things he says is that we shouldn't worry about the fact that our big cities are moving away from their regional and national hinterlands. Um, we should just accept that because the advantages of concentrating economic activity in the city uh, are so great that we shouldn't worry too much um, about what happens to the places left behind. So he's written a series of articles more recently about why we shouldn't worry about the fate of industrial cities like Buffalo in, the, in, in New York State. We should just accept that there's not much you can do about those places. The future is New York City. He's even written an article uh, in which he says that uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, he speculates whether it would have been better for the US government to give tickets to people who lived in New Orleans to move elsewhere rather than to rebuild New Orleans. That would have been a more productive um, uh, uh, intervention on the part of government. So, so he's not worried about those, those kinds of inter-regional inequalities, and neither is he actually very worried about intra-regional inequalities. He's berated Mayor de Blasio recently in New York City for worrying about the two cities of New York, the rich and the poor. He argues we shouldn't worry about that. Um, concentration of the poor in the city is actually a demonstration of its success because poor people want to be there because there are economic opportunities there. So we shouldn't worry about these kinds of inequalities. Um, and for these reasons, he's rather skeptical in a sense that planning uh, and governance makes much difference uh, to the fate of cities. So that's the first set of ideas, which I think are dominating debates about cities. Uh, certainly in the UK, we can, these ideas resonate in, the, uh, in, in many areas of our political uh, thinking. Second interesting book, um, which has come out of the United States, uh, comes from the Brookings Institution, The Metropolitan Revolution. And this looks at the way in which we must think of cities not just as um, jurisdictions based around CBDs, but instead we should think about cities as metropolitan regions with complex relationships between CBDs and suburbs. And in, the implication here is that um, we should be constructing mechanisms of governance at that scale, the metropolitan scale, because most urban and regional problems operate at the metropolitan scale. They don't operate at the, at the level of individual jurisdictions. This again is an idea which is had a, lot, uh, a set of ideas which have had great influence in the UK, and I think they resonate perhaps with some current debates in, in Sydney. Then the final book, um, which I uh, think has, has had a big influence in the UK, or at least codifies a set of arguments which is certainly very influential in the UK, is a book by the political scientist Brendan Barber, If Mayors Rule the World. And in this book, which is very much like most of these books, influenced by the American experience, he argues that um, American national politics is completely dysfunctional. Washington is incapable of making decisions. Um, decisions are an accidental byproduct of power plays which take place within, uh, within Washington. But he argues that in the United States, mayors tend to operate uh, very effectively. They produce good outcomes for the citizens of, of cities. So we have this idea of dysfunctional nations and rising cities. Why are mayors uh, so uh, uh, effective? Well, according to Barber, it's because mayors are close to the problems that most citizens care about on a daily basis. Schools, transport, housing, hospitals. And in general, he argues in the United States and also in other parts of the world, 
mayors deal with these problems in very pragmatic ways. They have to because they're embedded in these communities uh, and they need to sort these problems out uh, in, 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 in practical ways uh, rather than in ideological ways. So these are three important ideas which emerge from some major contributions which uh, uh, have come from uh, academics. But what's interesting about all of these books is that they've been picked up and read by policymakers. They've been reviewed in the, in the newspapers, the serious newspapers and in magazines. They are ideas which have moved out of the academy, as it were, into the, into the arena of public policy in a very direct way. So these are the ideas that are in the back of my mind as I tell the London story. Um, there is a set of more interesting, oh, perhaps not more interesting, but more <laughs> equally interesting uh, ideas which we can draw from academic uh, uh, literature, which perhaps doesn't catch the eye of, of newspaper review editors. Um, and one set of ideas that we're involved with at, at UCL are with colleagues at Sciences Po in Paris um, who are developing a research program around this idea of the ungovernable met metropolis. Uh, in which they argue that the interdependencies between places which, uh, and the externalities, the economic externalities between places, which are identified by uh, the, 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 the work of the Brookings Institution, exist in many cities alongside uh, highly fragmented political jurisdictions um, and uh, alongside a mismatch between the scale of need and the scale of governance. Um, that's to say, certain kinds of problems spill over the jurisdictional boundaries of local authorities uh, and we don't have the institutions to deal with those, uh, those, um, uh, those problems. And this contributes to what uh, Michael Storper from the LSE calls uh, the problem of the ungovernable metropolis. Um, certainly in a European context um, and, and in other parts of the world too, perhaps not so much in Australia, um, these problems of the ungovernable metropolis exist within uh, a set of fiscal and financial strains that are a product of austerity policies. Certainly in the UK, um, at the point where we're told that local governments matter more than ever in solving the problems of uh, cities, we find that the resources they have available are being massively reduced. And we see that across Europe. An additional part of the problem uh, for thinking about the governance of cities refers to a more general problem which the economist recently referred to as democratic distemper. The fact that citizens, particularly in democratic societies, are becoming increasingly disenchanted with the way in which they're governed. And we see all sorts of expressions of that um, in different countries. Um, and these ideas are picked up by other academics such as uh, Colin Crouch, uh, whose work I, I find really interesting, who talks about the way we now live in a post-democratic society. We have all the infrastructure of democracy, but the citizen feels that he or she has no capacity to influence the outcomes of the political process. So in all of this, then, I ask the question, what difference does a metro mayor make? In London, we have, ex we have initiated this experiment of creating a mayor, a directly elected mayor, to govern the metropolitan area. How successful has that experiment been in the context of the issues that I've just outlined? So I'd like now to turn my attention to the, uh, the question of London itself um, and say a few words about London in order to contextualise its problems, the problems which the, the, this, this innovation in governance are, are supposed to solve um, and uh, uh, the problems with which our mayor is grappling. So I want to look first at London's relationship with the rest of the UK because this, is, this becomes very important for the story as it evolves. Um, and this cartoon taken from the right-wing uh, magazine The Spectator in the, uh, in the UK, uh, I think you have a version of it here um, as well, uh, su is suggestive of a very powerful metaphor um, which uh, is abroad in the UK and this is the idea that London somehow socially, economically, culturally, politically, is separating from the rest of the country. It's becoming this kind of city-state uh, which has fewer and fewer connections with the rest of the country. Um, and that's, 
an important idea to keep in mind. Okay, so just to re-emphasize a point I made earlier, London's a very old place. Um, medieval city here in, when, when is this? Uh, about 1300, um, was contained within the city walls. And those city walls really, as far as we know, more or less corresponded to the walls of the, of the Roman city. So it's been around for a long time uh, as, a, as a center of economic and also of, of, of political power. Um, the, uh, the, the English writer Ford, Maddox Ford, writing at the turn of the 20th century, noted how precociously centralized England was as a polity throughout its history, particularly in the Middle Ages, you know, when, when France and Italy and Germany were, were, a group of, was, were a group of warring regions, England was already centralized around a very strong capital. And in a sense, he argues, uh, has, it's always, London has always been the center for administration, which has attracted wealth. Uh, and it's, it's also the center for the arts, industry, recreation, and so on. All roads lead to London in, in the English context. That's important to bear in mind uh, in all of this. And the gap between London and uh, the rest of the UK has widened uh, throughout the uh, last sort of quarter, or widened throughout the last third or quarter of the 20th century. So here we see the Greater Southeast GSE, Greater Southeast of England. Um, so that's London and the surrounding regions. In terms of GVA per head, gross value added per head, the main measure of, of regional output in the UK, moving away from the UK average, where all the rest of the regions of the UK moving uh, below the average. Scotland somehow moving around the average, which may be significant for, for current events, we will we'll see. But we see that in particular, the traditional northern industrial regions of the UK, seeing the gap between them and the national average, and more importantly, them and the, and, and the southeast of England, widen significantly during this period. This is the period up to the financial crisis. Uh, the evidence is that these gaps are wide, have widened even more during the financial crisis. So there's a social and economic divide between London and the rest of the country. And it's reflected in part by, um, it's reflected in uh, patterns of migration where we see uh, basically a movement of population from north to south uh, in, in England. Lots of detail on some of these slides. I'm not going to dwell too much on the detail. I'll make the slides available for anybody who uh, wants them afterwards. But the point is that uh, London attracts population from the north. It expels some at certain points in the life cycle to neighboring regions. Um, and what we get is the emergence of a kind of larger southeast of England centered on London, um, which uh, is a, a, the, the sort of dominant demographic factor in the UK at the moment. Partly alongside this, we have the emergence of highly segregated housing markets, uh, reflecting some of these uh, broader socioeconomic and demographic developments. Um, so we see there's a, a core London housing market surrounded in concentric circles by the suburbs and the inner commuting areas. But we can draw a line from the uh, Bristol Channel to the Wash, and above that, the whole of England, in effect, forms a separate housing market to the ones below that line. Um, and that, makes, that means that in the current environment, despite, uh, these, traditional despite these traditional patterns of north-south migration, it's increasingly difficult to migrate from north to south because housing costs are so much higher in the south. Um, if you sell your house in the north of England, and try to buy the equivalent in London, it's impossible. Now, this is not unique, of course, to, to the UK, but these issues are an impediment to the, uh, to the mobility of labor and to the attraction of uh, labor into London in the way that um, someone like um, Ed Glazer would suggest would be a good thing. So we have these highly segregated housing markets with London at the center of a series of concentric circles. Um, and all of, this, all of these processes contribute to the emergence of London as a mega city region. My, my uh, colleague, Sir Peter Hall, who, who, uh, who, who died just recently, uh, was very strongly associated with this idea that we should think of London as being at the center of a wider uh, global mega region um, with patterns of, of, of commuting concentrated on London, but also linking 
other nodes in, in the regional in, in the wider regional labour market. So I'm setting London then in, in this national context as a as a sort of almost economically speaking semi-independent um, mega region. London also has relationships with the rest of the world. <clears throat> um, and in, in one sense, of course, we talk about global cities as a modern phenomenon. In many ways, you know, we could make the case that London's always been a global city. It was, of course, as this painting by Niels Muller Lund uh, describes it, the heart of empire, with the city of London, the financial district, representing uh, that relationship. And London remains, uh, by some measures, the preeminent global financial centre uh, in the world integrated in a way that perhaps say New York and Hong Kong are not in the same way, uh, very open to international flows of finance. So an important global financial centre and that's the driver behind these patterns of economic change. As the North's deindustrialized, London uh, has expanded its financial sector and that partly explains the gaps that I've just outlined in, in social and economic terms. But more latterly, London has also become a centre for uh, all kinds of international investment, not just uh, the, most, the more obvious and conventional forms of financial services related investment. Notably here, we see that uh, it becomes a major centre for investments in real estate from ultra high net worth individuals. Sydney also um, arguably is, a, a, an important, uh, is important in this respect, but we see the relative importance uh, uh, of these processes in reshaping the London economy uh, in, this, in this figure. So, in a sense, Lon London's global position uh, builds on its historic uh, role as, a, as the financial entrepot of the British Empire, but it's being transformed uh, in recent times by these, these, more, uh, these more innovative processes. Now, one, if you were to go to France, um, and, and, and speak to the French political elites, they would say that, that London is merely an international money laundering centre for Russian oligarchs, Middle Eastern despots, and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, that's the French view. Okay. Um, so we, we have these processes reshaping the relationship between London and its, uh, its host national economy, and London and the rest of the world. Um, what's been going on in, in, in social and economic terms uh, within London itself that we need to know about in order to think about the difference a mayor has made? Well, one thing to bear in mind about London, and this is something that makes it, I think, a bit different to Sydney, is that really from the end of the Second World War through to the beginning of the 1980s, London was losing population. Um, partly a product of policies to encourage this process, designed to reduce overcrowding and so on, partly a result of the fact that some of its traditional industries like ports and so on uh, uh, were being restructured and losing very significant amounts of labour. But what we see in London is that from the mid-1980s onwards, an explosion of population growth, partly reflecting the resurgence of the financial services sector and everything that's gone on around it, um, uh, uh, since uh, financial deregulation was enacted by the Thatcher government in the 1980s. Okay, so that's an interesting story in itself, but it's more interesting if we compare London with other European cities. Berlin, a good example, um, a place which, despite uh, uh, its reincorporation into uh, the larger German economy, hasn't really experienced the kind of population resurgence that some might have imagined. And then Paris. Okay, a, a, a story of population decline over the same period that London's population has been growing. So there's something interesting happening here. And um, you can see where the French resentment comes from. And current predictions are that London's population will grow at an even faster rate than the, pop, than the population in other regions of the UK. So we're expecting these trends to continue. These are the official uh, projections from the Office for National Statistics in the UK. Um, we expect in the UK population to grow in general, but for, the, for that population growth to be concentrated in London and in the surrounding regions. 
So London is a city which has experienced a, a kind of social and economic resurgence, population growth, but it's also a city which, has, uh, which is marked by significant amounts of uh, deprivation. And um, this is one way of representing this in spatial terms. The index of multiple deprivation is a measure uh, used by uh, the UK government um, to define the most disadvantaged ward level, that's to say small, uh, small areas of, uh, uh, in terms of their, uh, a range of different indicators of deprivation. And what we see here is, in the same, in the same, in the same way that we see a kind of north-south divide in the UK, we see an east-west divide uh, in London with deprivation primarily concentrated in the eastern parts uh, of London. Um, scattered around elsewhere, but very obviously in the eastern parts of, of London. So those are the areas where uh, I suppose the, the benefits of this resurgence of, in London, the, the, the real estate investments that I've pointed to, the growth of financial services, these, have, um, uh, the, the, these benefits have not been distributed, of course, equally across the city. Uh, and one expression of all of this came in 2011, um, when we saw the outbreaking of, of very, very serious rioting in London. Um, now, the, the reasons why people riot are extremely complex. Um, you know, when I'm not making simple uh, co causal relationships here, but it's worth noting that much of this rioting took place in the blue zones on that map. The other thing to bear in mind in all of this, um, in terms of socio-economic change, relates to this issue of austerity that I talked about earlier on. Uh, local government in the UK has borne perhaps the brunt of uh, public expenditure cuts made by central government. This is an issue because in, in the UK context, central government provides by far the majority of the resources of local authorities. And we can see the darker shaded areas on this map are the areas which have had to, uh, which have seen the biggest reductions in um, Public, uh, in, in expenditure by local government. We see red dots in the northern industrial cities, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, and so on. We see a red dot in London. So in that sense, the London local authorities have shared some of this pain. The big difference, as we'll come on to discover, is that in London, there are other sources, private sources of, 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 um, of money uh, for all kinds of economic activities, which are not available for the reasons I've already described in those northern cities. So this partly explains the continuing process of socio-economic polarization that I've already hinted at. So that's the London context. Um, how is all this governed then? And where does governance intersect with these processes in terms of the relationship between uh, London and its, and its national context, London and the world, and in terms of these socio-economic processes. Uh, this is, for those of you who don't know, is City Hall, the seat of the mayor uh, in London. Um, so what I want to do in this section briefly is to outline the problem as far as governance is concerned, a little bit about the history, talk about the structures which have been created recently, and then look at uh, how the mayor uh, organizes his activities and his strategies. Back in 2004, Tony Travers, the great guru of London governance at the LSE, talked about how governing London is a complex business. It, it's a vast uh, population, a complex geography. There's a long history which makes governing the place very, very difficult. And as a consequence, he notes, London has been subject to periodic revolutions in the way that it's governed. Um, and the reasons for these, rev for, for these revolutions in governance I'm not going to go into a great, in, into in a great deal of detail because of time, but uh, uh, you know the, the reforms often reflect, as I said here, the players, the power players between different social and political economic actors, as much as the search for uh, solutions to agreed problems. The, govern the modern governance of London we trace back to the 19th century, when you know London's population was expanding. Um, in London was participating in the Industrial Revolution in the UK at that time. And, and things needed to be done. Sewers needed to be built. Um, so William Bazalgette, the famous uh, engineer who built the London sewer system. Um, great breakthrough in public health, uh, represented in this very famous uh, picture by Ford Maddox Brown work, the laying of the sewers in, uh, in Hampstead in, in London. Ford Maddox Brown, of course, being the great, no, couldn't have been the great, the grandfather 
of uh, Ford Maddox Ford, who I quoted earlier on. So we're keeping it in the family at this point. So um, practical problems, how do we get rid of sewage? How do we transport people? Led to the creation of a series of um, uh, uh, single purpose organizations designed to tackle each of these individual problems. But by the end of the 19th century, it was agreed that there was a problem of coordinating the activities of those organizations concerned with transport, those concerned with sewerage, those concerned with schools, those concerned with health. So it was out of that concern or debate emerged the London County Council in 1888, which lasted till 1964. It was replaced by the GLC, the Great London Council, uh, which lasted till 1986. GLC was abolished by Margaret Thatcher in 1986, and for between then and 2000, there was no strategic regional governance in London uh, until the creation of the GLA, which I mentioned earlier on. So this is what London County Council looked like. Um, it, it contained a number of uh, individual boroughs, but it provided a set of services which individual boroughs couldn't. Um, uh, and it was the first attempt to, to, to plan London at a metropolitan scale in that sense and provide services in a metropolitan scale. It was replaced by the GLC, which extended the boundaries, the administrative boundaries of London, created these 32 boroughs that I talked about earlier on, which comprised mergers of the smaller boroughs that, I, that, I, that were in the previous map. And the GLC provided a set of strategic services uh, for the whole metropolitan area. As I said, Margaret Thatcher abolished this institution in 1986. I should say at this point that, you know, Myself and Professor Hal Porson of UNSW both worked for the GLC at this time. So if there's any pain being felt here, you'll understand why. And this is, a great, this is one of the great demonstrations against that abolition that took place in 1984. And I'm certainly in there somewhere, and I, I suspect Hal Porson was too. Um, so we were asking Margaret Thatcher not to abolish the GLC. Um, she didn't listen, um, and she abolished it. So we had this interregnum of... Uh, of no strategic governance in London. This was widely regarded almost from the outset as a disastrous set of outcomes because London needed to be planned at the strategic scale. And a, a, a slow process began of making a case for a strategic form of governance on the same boundaries as the GLC, but looking quite different. And at the heart of it was this idea that instead of having a traditional council made up with, of lots of members, Authority in the new model should be invested in this idea of the elected mayor, elected by the whole of London. And this proposal was put to a referendum. And as you can see, it was supported by 72% of the people of London, 28% um, against, uh, with the turnout actually being comparatively low. So there wasn't a great public clamour for this, but nevertheless, uh, it was uh, 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 a reasonably successful uh, democratic innovation from that point of view. But note, that the, the, the highest levels of support for the idea of the mayor and assembly were in the centre of London. The, the suburbs were, uh, uh, were less interested in, in the proposition. So there's some, already some uh, tensions in this, in this model. Um, so what was created as a result of this was this idea of the GLA, which, in, which was a strategic authority. It was going to be solely focused on strategic issues, not in uh, detailed service delivery. Uh, its authority was going to be invested primarily in an elected mayor. There will be a London Assembly of 25 members, as I said earlier, which would oversee the work of the mayor. And it has a staff, or it did have a staff, of about 600. It might have gone slightly up since then. The mayor has responsibilities to promote uh, sustainable development. And essentially, is concerned with preparing plans and policies to this effect, overseen by the Assembly. Below him, the, the, the boroughs uh, continue providing lots of local services the 32 boroughs, so the mayor has to work in conjunction with them. Uh, and central government provides most of the resource for, for the activities of the GLA. The mayor doesn't have any significant tax raising powers of his own. The first mayor was elected as, a, uh, as an independent, although he was a very, very strongly, uh, he, he was a left wing uh, Labour uh, member of parliament before he stood to be mayor as an independent. Uh, he created a, a, a quite a complex structure uh, around the, the GLA with agencies for economic development, transport, uh, civil defence and the police. Some of these were established legislatively. Um, and a range of other bodies, all of which were designed to, pr 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 to, sort of um, to, to push his agendas around design, climate change, 
tourism, studying in London, and so on. Uh, the, the most recent mayor, we've only had two, both have served two terms, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, has slimmed down these structures somewhat. Um, and in particular, he's abolished many of the bodies which were established under the last mayor and concentrated power around himself personally. Um, so there's a bit of a significant difference in the way the two mayors operate. Uh, all, all carefully within the, 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 the parliamentary legislation which established all of this. So that's the structures. The mayor's role is to, is to develop strategies. He doesn't have any significant financial resources directly of his own. Uh, he has to work in cooperation with the boroughs and many other agencies around London. Where does planning fit into this? Well, planning fits in because, well, London's always been subject to uh, various forms of spatial planning. We can go back to the so-called Abercrombie Plan, which was designed during the Second World War, which saw London... Uh, we saw the future of London in terms of population decanting out to new towns which would be established around the edge of London. A very important planning constraint in London was established uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War and that was the establishment of a, of a green belt around London which was designed to limit the growth of, of, of London in this respect. So, these are, so London's always been subject to these kinds of planning and, um, uh, and in particular the urban growth constraint uh, is arising from the green belt, part of which is in London, but which mainly is in the neighbouring uh, peri-urban local authorities, if you like, the shires that surround London, the counties that surround London, um, is a constraint on what can be done in terms of planning. So the role of the mayor then is to set the strategic planning framework and make sure that, which is called the London plan, and make sure that agencies in London comply with this plan. And it can also uh, determine strategic planning applications. The boroughs deal with local planning issues um, and this means that there's always the potential for conflict between the boroughs and the mayor about, what's, about what should happen in terms of uh, planning issues. The assembly plays a rather minor role in all of this, scrutinising the activities of the mayor in particular. So the London plan then is this key, key statement of the mayor's uh, objectives. Um, what about the London plan? Does it represent a long-term plan for London? To what extent can we see differences in the way in which different mayors uh, have, create, uh, 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 have designed and executed the plan? It's all about strategy. Where can we see delivery? To what extent can we associate it with innovation and success? The London Plan was, it was intended to provide a street strategic framework for the long-term sustainable growth of London. But mayors have found it impossible not to keep tinkering with it. And we're, we're currently undertaking yet another review of the London Plan. And the central criticism which has been levelled at all of this is that it's all strategy and no action. Um, so there's, there's great opportunities here for individual mayors to influence uh, what happens, but also there are the, the actions of mayors are, are, are constrained quite strongly by the national policy environment because the mayor can't make laws, he has no money, he has to rely on cooperation of, of central government. So what we have is this sort of form of personalised planning where the whims of the mayor do matter. So we've had two mayors, each have produced their plans. Um, in many ways they look quite similar, but there are subtle differences between them. So the first mayor, Ken Livingston, very much promoted this idea of London as a world city, had very many battles with central government about additional investment, but strongly focused on the idea of sustainable development and the idea of decentralising activity away from the centre to what he called opportunity areas. And in particular was interested in developing the eastern parts of London, partly because there was space to do that there, but partly also because, as we've seen, those are the areas which needed development. He was very pres prescriptive in terms of what he asked the, the boroughs to do. The Johnson approach is quite different. He's less interested in this world city narrative. He accepts the importance of sustainability, but he's, you know, he's also a bit of a climate change sceptic. Uh, he talks much more about, in vague terms, about quality of life. He's certainly much less prescriptive in his relationships with the boroughs uh, than, than was, was Livingston. Um, and uh, he's, he's accused of being too close to developers. That's become an important part of the narrative around uh, Mayor Johnson recently. In terms of issues, how does this play out? Let's look at briefly at these issues before I draw some conclusions. So housing. Housing is the... Is, 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 as in Sydney, as in other global cities, 
an issue of massive importance. And of course, the main issue concerns housing affordability. By at least this measure, the UK has the, most, uh, has the least affordable housing market in the world, and London's housing is significantly less affordable than the UK average. So the, the problem of housing affordability is, is a key one for the mayor to, to address, uh, for the, and a key one for London's economic uh, and social development. In London, the production of affordable housing is at historic, ro at, at historic lows. We have never built fewer units of affordable housing. The reasons for that are, are complex. Um, uh, part, of the, uh, part of the issue in London is, ha has been traditionally uh, a lack of uh, land on which to build. Um, but the, the housing affordability question uh, is more complex than that. In London, uh, at the moment, um, the way in which the central government is dealing with this problem is by putting a benefit on the social welfare payments which uh, low-income households can have in order to live in central London. So they're cutting what, what we call housing benefit. Um, and in effect, the effect of this in the longer run will be to squeeze out those people who can't afford to live in this increasingly unaffordable housing market. So the key task in London is to build. Um, building will take place in these opportunity areas which were identified in uh, the London plan. And as you can see, most of these uh, opportunity areas are in the eastern parts of London, in former industrial areas. The long strip running north to south is the Lee Valley, and then the, the London Docklands areas uh, uh, as well. So the idea is that housing should be concentrated in these, in these areas. Um, but the problem is that even if London was to build housing in these areas, it still couldn't meet the unta untapped demand for housing there. Uh, that, that exists in London, given the, the sort of um, population projections that we're, that we're looking at. The real space to build housing exists outside of London, but the problem is the mayor has no jurisdiction outside of London. Um, and that is a consequence. Um, the relationship between the mayor and the surrounding areas is, is another, um, another uh, relationship characterised by tension. So if we see here, if we look, if we look at this map, we see that uh, in parts of London, there's some significant house building, but in the areas immediately around it, contained within the London Green Belt, um, there's scarcely any house building taking place because the Green Belt, uh, the rules around the Green Belt uh, preclude house building taking place um, because of the, uh, the traditional role of the Green Belt in managing urban containment. So that we see that the places which are building housing are beyond the Green Belt. So the only places where housing is being built is quite far from London. Um, and that means that in order to find affordable housing, commuters are having to leap beyond the inner suburbs and travel further in order to achieve affordable housing. And this is placing great strains on the transport system and on household budgets uh, in the southeast of England. And the mayor can do very little uh, about all of this. I'm going to skip the, that, that slide. The other issue which is at work in the London housing market, very fam which, which will be very familiar to... Um, to you in, in Sydney, is that um, much of the new housing that has been built, especially at the higher end of the market in London, is being, being acquired by foreign uh, buyers, often for investment purposes rather than uh, to meet particular housing needs. And this is, so we see that in, in housing, housing which is uh, worth, worth 1,000 to 2,000 uh, pounds per square foot, um, almost all of that housing is going to foreign buyers in London. I know there's some, probably a somewhat similar process taking place uh, in, in the UK, in, in, in Sydney. So if we look at transport, so, that, so that's the housing story. That's the housing story. Affordability crisis, mayor making interventions, but the interventions are too small to make a difference, and the solutions to the problem are on a larger scale than the mayor's jurisdiction. Transport. This is one area where the mayoral system seems to have made a significant difference. The most significant policy change associated with the mayoral office was enacted by the first mayor, and it was around the introduction of congestion charging, a charge to drive your car into central London. Um, I think it's about £11.50 to drive your car into central London per day, um, which amounts to a significant amount of money over the course of a week, obviously. 
Um, so the prevention of, uh, uh, so the introduction of the congestion charge supported in a referendum, very significant and brave political decision by the first mayor, um, Ken Livingstone. Alongside that congestion charge, what we've seen in London is a massive increase in the use of public transport, um, particularly the use of the bus under the first mayor, also the use of the tube, and we see a diminishing use of the car in London. Very significant in this respect. And why this is particularly significant, because in the, the, this marks out London as being quite different from the rest of uh, the UK. Um, so in the case of buses, for instance, which the first mayor was very keen on, we see that bus use is going up in London, whereas it's declining in the rest of the UK. Partly because the mayor had re regulatory powers to be able to invest in and, and control the bus system, and also uh, was able to put a large amount of money f generated by the congestion charge into public transport. The other big development which has occurred is, the, uh, is in terms of public transport, big investments, uh, particularly in Crossrail, a new underground line across London, and the mayor played a role in advocating for that, although the bulk of the money has come from central government. Um, this is a, 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 an investment which has had massive implications for the uh, locations around uh, stations, which um, uh, have seen massive property hikes in anticipation of this, uh, of, of this new line opening. So we see here that a property uplift within half a mile of one of these new cross rail stations of 54% after uh, the uh, legislation was enacted to, to make this rail line possible. Um, partly, f partly the mayor has funded, uh, partly the mayor's contribution to the funding of this uh, railway line has come in the form of a, 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 a levy on developments that are taking place in boroughs which are going to benefit from, uh, uh, f from uh, the cross rail. So there's an attempt to, to, to capture some of the value. I'm going to just skip on here. London's economy, highly concentrated around London. That might seem natural because that, that spike of activity uh, where people work uh, looks very similar to Sydney, but it looks very different to other European countries like, right, like the Netherlands where employment is uh, much more decentralised among places. Driven by financial services as we see here, but also by the emergence of uh, new sectors such as digital industries, business services, tourism, creative industries and so on. Big increase in employment in certain boroughs in London in these new creative industries, particularly some of the inner eastern boroughs around the city of London. Um, particularly concentrated in certain postcode areas like EC1, that's the area around Shoreditch and Clerkenwell for those of you who know. Massive concentration of startups. London from being a place which was losing jobs is now an entrepreneurial hotspot, lots of new startups. And the fastest growing sectors are not now financial services, but the digital economy services. And this is another attractive force within London. As industries move out, they leave space. Um, and, in, and in the UK, we talk about the regeneration, urban regeneration in the context of developing these major sites. This is the, this is the area around uh, St Pancras and King's Cross stations, massive area. Uh, for re regeneration, where Google Europe will have its headquarters, among others. Um, and what we've seen, partly driven by these uh, developments in the residential sector that I talked about, partly seen by the expansion of um, key sectors of the economy, is a massive um, increase in the construction of new buildings uh, in London, exemplified by the Shard. Um, very complicated structures at times because the key planning issue in terms of de developing tall buildings in London is that the view of St Paul's Cathedral from certain points of London must be protected. That's uh, one of these iconic things in London planning which is difficult to explain why it exists but nevertheless shapes the geography of the city. So in Lo London has more cranes at work than in all the rest of the UK put together building this new um, uh, city of tower blocks. The mayor set out his future plans for infrastructure to support population growth and expanding economy, etc., in a London infrastructure plan, which, as you can see here, is claiming the need for £1.3 trillion worth of investment by 2050. So a lot of infrastructure has got to go in to support this dense development. So let me, let me draw some very brief conclusions then. So one issue which emerges from this discussion is the extent to which London emerges 
as the national champion of the, uh, of the UK economy. And as a consequence, London's development is contrib contributing to an even more imbalanced national political economy. And there seems to be no counterbalance to that in, in UK urban and regional policy uh, at, at the moment. So London's powering ahead more people, more jobs, uh, more demand for infrastructure, um, but real problems around housing affordability in particular. And what we see is that we've created an institution in the form of the mayor in which, uh, who has some power to shape these events within the administrative boundaries of London, but the, but the solution to the problems often will require actions to be taken outside of his jurisdiction. So there's a, there's a very serious issue there about London's relationship with the rest of its mega region. Mega region. We're seeing very significant public investment, but the much of the return on that investment uh, is going uh, to, the pr to, to private actors, particularly in the forms of the kind of property uplift that we see, for instance, around the development of new uh, underground and railway stations with uh, very little, um, uh, very few mechanisms to redistribute some of the gains arising from that uh, to, to those groups who are currently excluded from them. So uh, some really big questions there about uh, what price inequality and also questions of livability uh, arise here because in, in, question, in, in relation to livability, London's position in the economist ranking is continuing to drop. Okay, so as more and more people are moving in, infrastructure strains, housing problems, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we maintain London's livability in that context? And then the final question that I, that I raised at the beginning, really, um, what difference has the mayor made in all of this? We can point to individual policies where the mayor's actions have produced arguably sort of uh, clear outcomes, the congestion charge, increasing patronage of buses, but measured against the scale of London's problems, is that enough? One of the issues is that so much power being concentrated in one person might itself be part of the issue here. And we might be working with a rather thin notion of what accountability and democracy means uh, in, in, in this uh, executive metropolitan mayor model. Um, but the, the notion of the mayor making a difference, well, he's only been in office essentially since 2000. So perhaps it's too early to say. You know, uh, Zhao Enlai is perhaps apocryphally said to have answered the question, what difference did the French Revolution make by answering it's too early to say. Um, and it might be too early to say what difference the mayor has made, but I hope that's given you an insight into what's happening uh, at the moment in London. Thank you very much.